all-wheel drive. Practical and efficient, convenient and cool. That's why we might buy an electric SUV. And there's no electric minivans. Which, is that really a bad thing? And these two are more similar than they are different, especially on paper. But today we'll explore the real life reasons why one might be better than the other. Let's break it down. The last time I compared these cars, only one existed. But by this point, I've driven the ocean, explored the infotainment in depth, gotten feedback from the owners about their experience with it, including customer service, support, driving dynamics, emotion, and more. And I've owned the Tesla for two years today, literally. If you want to compare specs and features, check out my last head-to-head. -head. Just ignore the pricing in that video because it's almost a year old and it's wrong for both vehicles. Today we'll tackle everything else and I'll update you on prices too. I'm saving the conclusion for the end though, so make sure you stick around and subscribe if deep dive comparisons are your kind of thing. I've done many and I've got a bunch more coming. I got this comment on a recent video. The only unbiased car reviewer would be the one that's never driven a car and that would be over after the first drive. We fall in love with cars. They are tools for emotion and nostalgia, among many other things. We like cars for different reasons, looks, comfort, utility, brand loyalty, even our friends play a role in what we drive. I am often asked, what's the hardest adjustment when switching to an electric car? And you may be surprised, but it's your social circle. Convincing family, friends, acquaintances that you've made the right decision is the hardest part. That's why we call it adoption. And because the world is going through the most transformative transportation revolution in 100 years, there's a lot to adopt, and that also means there's a lot to defend. I let a relative in his late 70s drive my Model Y over Thanksgiving break. It was his first experience with an electric vehicle. I'm convinced the robots are going to take over. I am a true believer now, was his exact quote when my family asked him about what he thought about the drive. And as far as comparisons go, the Ocean versus Model Y is the best one at least right now, because the Model Y is such a different animal than pretty much anything else in its class. It's made by a company that does direct sales. That company only delivers electric vehicles. And there's a lot of controversy involved in whether that's a good or a bad thing. But the Ocean is also all of those things. And with that said, I'll go over some comparisons with the Ocean and the Model Y based on what they both are today. Big emphasis on today. This video will be imperfect because of that. But right now there are people shopping these two vehicles like crazy. And I wanna give you an idea of what an Ocean and a Model Y are like side by side. And then you can decide if I'm truly biased. Let's start it off with the biggest motivating factor for the most people, which is price. When it's time to configure your vehicle, there are three types of trim you're kind of shooting for. I want the best one, I want the cheapest one, or I want the best value. So let's look at those for the Model Y and the Fisker Ocean. And first, let's talk about the Fisker Ocean 1. The price is high, but Fisker has made some promises about Ocean 1s if you can get a hold of one. Free infotainment upgrades, that's a hardware benefit. New chips as they become available, but it implies that the current chip is slow. Free over-the-air updates for life, this is great, but implies that other trims would have to pay for select upgrades. Lifetime premium connectivity, implying that premium connectivity is not free for other trims, which is clearly explained in the manual. However, the price is not. A wireless hotspot will also be free for 10 years. Also, no published cost for the other trims. When new features are available, they'll be made available to Ocean One owners first. And the basic warranty extended 12,000 miles to 72,000, plus a four year 48,000 mile warranty on select components. No idea what that means. The first tire replacement is free and there's a $1,000 charge point credit that's also applied. And when the Ocean One sells out, the extreme trim has everything the Ocean One has except those benefits I just mentioned, but it's $7,500 less until you spec it out, which could make it cost significantly more than the Ocean One, which is why I don't have it listed as any of the value propositions. But as of this moment right now, there are fully specced Fisker Ocean Ones in inventory available for sale. Now let's look at the best Tesla. The Model Y performance speaks for itself at 52,490 plus a $7,500 tax credit eligibility. Also inventory discounts are available regularly at this time. While the Ocean One doesn't offer discounts, a promotional interest rate rate is being offered, but the eligibility is limited. I made an entire video. You can check it out in the description. The complexity starts with the cheapest versions. While the Model Y rear wheel drive comes with all the interior and technology options offered in every Model Y, the Ocean Sport is Spartan at best at this base price. 
No adaptive crews, no cabin preconditioning, no heated seats, just to name some of the big ones. Once you get to the packages, Fisker has now decided how much it costs for you to get all the stuff included on the Ocean One in these lower trims. And that cost is $6,999. The Fisker Max package combines all four OTA packages, Intelligent Pilot, Performance, Winner, and Ultimate packages into an all-in-one download to get the maximum safety, convenience, performance, and fun out of your Fisker Ocean Sport or Ultra. Notice Fisker leaves safety out of the base model. And I assume that reference to safety is regarding the Fisker Intelligent Pilot package that features a 360 degree surround view, evasive steering assist, park my car, integrated drive assist, which is just autopilot with a less cool name, lane change assist, and rear cross traffic mitigation. Adding just those features to your sport will run you $2,950. For $3,950, you can get the Ultimate Package, which has the revolving screen, Hollywood mode streaming services, I guess those aren't included if you don't add this package, premium connectivity, a web browser, valet mode, seat memory, and rain sensing wipers. That's right, no seat memory in an ocean sport. To unlock the performance, that package runs $699 and includes hyper mode with quicker acceleration and boost mode with more quicker acceleration. But for just over $1,000, you get the heated seats and preconditioning as part of the winter package, which is an absolute must for any new EV in my opinion. You also get a heated steering wheel, heated washer nozzles, remote climate control, and a wiper defrost. And if you're wondering why this price is higher than the base price, it's because I've selected a black one. All the colors cost extra. Tesla does it too. The same is true with the wheels, and I have yet to see any high quality photographs or videos of the base wheels for the ocean. The Ultra is the same story when it comes to features. None of the stuff is included, and you have to add it all in the form of packages. To make the Ultra competitive with the Model Y, you have to add the Max package, because basically all those features are included which takes you up to $59,998. If you want the most Spartan but smartest example, you need to add just the winter package, which takes you to $54,194. If you want adaptive cruise control and the winter package, which should be included with basically every new car in 2024, that's $57,144. And all of this pricing assumes you don't want nice wheels or a cool color. Oh, and interior. The interiors are extra too. And now is when I'll mention the extreme. If you want the stuff, and you add it to the Ultra, it's basically the same cost as the Extreme, except with the Extreme, you get the solar roof and a piecemeal of quirky extras. The TLDR here is that just like every other automaker, Fisker is not competitive against Tesla prices. Tesla decides what the market prices are. Fisker has just been doing the best they can to keep up. Okay, so anybody can tell me how much they cost, but what do they like to live with? The ocean rides better than the Y. I'm gonna tell you right now, the suspension is a blessing. This is very comfortable. Yeah, the Thank suspension you. is insanely good. The Y has better infotainment. And look at that, I just got a software update. Single pole autopilot, destination charging availability. That was this one, and I've gotten another one, and another one, since I started making this video. Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, YouTube, Twitch, TikTok. And yes, Disney Plus was taken from and then put back on this menu, which could be considered a drawback to owning a Tesla because at any point, Go yourself. <laughs> Is that clear? And then there's the, if you're not an adult menu. If you didn't realize, kids are the ones selling these cars. The Battle of Polytopia, Mahjong, Sudoku. Sky Force, Solitaire, Cat Quest, Fallout Shelter, Stardew Valley, Backgammon, Cuphead, Beach Buggy Racing, Chess, 2048, Asteroids, Centipede. And all the settings on how you play are right here. The ocean is more ergonomic and familiar. The Y has a more open feel inside the cabin. The Y is also boring inside for this reason. The ocean has cool interior features. The ocean is incomplete. The Y is road ready. The ocean looks cool, but the Model Y wins coolest charge port for sure. The Y looks like a duck or a frog or an AI interpretation of the air in the wind tunnel. The ocean has 22 inch wheels that behave like 20 inch wheels but they're only being tested by the winter right now. The Y has a harsh ride. The ocean's ride is very European and rides very much smoother. The ocean doesn't have sentry mode and dog mode. Another Fisker software update promise. The Model Y doesn't have a solar roof or taco trays. The Model Y has a glove box. 
The ocean has underseat storage bins. Unless you opt for the Ultra or the Sport model that have no underfloor storage, it's just the armrest. The ocean has variable rain sensing wiper settings. The Model Y has regular wiper settings and auto that just figures it out. The ocean has blind spot monitoring. The Y doesn't. The Ocean has lane keep assist. The Y lets you drive with the traffic aware cruise control off, but yells and corrects you if you go out of your lane with traffic aware cruise control on. We don't know what the Ocean does in traffic aware cruise control yet. It's an upcoming feature in an over the air update. The Ocean has parking assist coming soon, as well as a myriad of other features. More on that later. And if you have a two year old Model Y like I do, it has proximity sensors. But if you have a new one, the parking assist and the proximity sensing will continue to get better through over-the-air updates. The Model Y has smart navigation that uses real-time data to prevent you from navigating to a congested supercharger. The Ocean has a ton of EPA range, so hopefully you won't need that, because the network you're going to be using for that is much less reliable. The Ocean has iHeartRadio, Spotify, and TuneIn. The Model Y has Tidal and Apple Music, as well as Spotify. Neither have AM Radio. The Ocean has Apple TV and Prime Video. The Model Y has Netflix. Neither have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. The Model Y supports up to 10 driver profiles. The Ocean has profiles coming in an over-the-air update. The Ocean's adaptive cruise control is coming in an over-the-air update. And if you don't have an Ocean 1 or an Ocean Extreme, it's $3,000. Or you just have to go without. Will there be a subscription? We don't know. The Model Y comes standard with traffic-aware cruise control and lane centering. Want more than that? For $199 a month or $12,000, you can ask your vehicle to navigate all the way to your destination with just a few taps on the wheel every 30 seconds. But both companies are still figuring software out. All this other stuff included in this $12,000 price are not available right now on a new Model Y. The Ocean has comfortable, cool seats. You can get them in different materials, some of which are fully recycled and one of which is Alcantara. Aside from black and white, there's also Mala Blue, which looks great in person, as well as black and white. The Y has comfortable seats. They are offered in black and white. Neither vehicle has cooled seats. The Model Y climate controls work exactly the same in the Ocean as they do in the Model Y. The Tesla's climate control is all screen centric. The Ocean has some buttons, but both are visible all the time. And the Ocean does have a problem with the air vents not functioning properly until you get the right software update. The Ocean has a steering wheel heater. The Model Y has a two-stage steering wheel heater. The TPMS in the Ocean will tell you if your tire is low. The Tesla tells you precisely how much air is in each tire. And if those readings are not in real time, they will tell you the last time they were taken. The Model Y has Century Mode, and the Ocean does not plan to offer it, at least in any future updates right now. The Ocean has battery preconditioning. It's done automatically. The Model Y is also automatic with its preconditioning. The Model Y will navigate you to an open, functional, fast charging stall on your road trip. And if you don't want to go to that one, you can look at the real-time data for all the other nearby chargers to make the best decision for you. And yes, this is how it always is in West Virginia. If you see another Tesla at your supercharger, it's kind of weird. Don't want to use that bespoke, exclusive, fastest, 99.5% uptime charging network that Tesla offers because there's a charger nearby that has really cheap charging rates? No problem. You're two adapters away from using all the other types of charging, fast or slow. And one of those adapters comes with the car. The factory EVSE, that's electric vehicle supply equipment or most commonly known as a charger, has a set of adapters that will allow you to plug into anything with an electrical output. And it's small, lightweight and reliable. The Ocean comes with no charger and the only one you can buy is one you must install permanently in your home. Mobile charging is on you. The Ocean has a very useful navigation system if you know how to use it. Remember the Konami code? That's how the navigation system works. Lots of information, even the detail of upcoming chargers, right on your native navigation system. But the unconventional delivery of it makes it more like an Easter egg or a cheat code than a useful tool. As you can see, right now I'm looking at the detail of the upcoming charge stop I have on the route that the navigation system has chosen. What type is it? What's the max speed? How long will I have to sit there when I arrive? However, once I select the route, all that detail goes away. And now all I know about the upcoming charger is its location on the map and how long I'll have to charge when I arrive. I no longer know the speed or the provider. In order to add a waypoint, you have to select the genre of what you're looking for, then scroll to it in the order of distance from you before you can add it to your trip. 
And after you sleep on it and process it, you'll realize that this is pretty useful. But in the moment, all you want to do is type it in. And you can't. Type in Wendy's? Nope. Scroll to restaurants, then scroll through all the nearby restaurants until, hopefully, a Wendy's comes up. The good news is, only the restaurants that are on your current navigational route will be displayed. And now is as good a time as any to highlight the fact that Alexa is supposed to work on the ocean, but it doesn't. So there are no voice commands, but sometime in the future, there will be. And while we're at it, we might as well highlight all the but sometime in the future there will be's. Emergency lane departure avoidance, front cross traffic collision mitigation, auto high beam, smart traction, evasive steering assist, rear cross traffic collision mitigation, front cross traffic collision mitigation, emergency lane departure avoidance, traffic jam assist, adaptive cruise control, lane centering, lane change assist, automatic parking, power bank system, that's vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to home, and an external power outlet. Oh, and hill hold. That's right. Your Fisker Ocean does not hold the brake on a hill. Okay. There's Whoa. your rollback. Okay, yeah. the rollback. A little exciting, huh? Yeah. When you get to a hill and you let off the accelerator, you roll backwards. I'm on the pedal moving forward right now. I'm going to let off the accelerator. And that's its immediate rollback. Wow. But before you think these features aren't available, make sure you check to see if an update hasn't fixed them since the publishing of this video. For example, at the time of the publishing of this video, some ocean owners have the ability to connect to their ocean to Wi-Fi and some don't. Same with the trip meter. Don't think that sounds bad? It's a nightmare. This is a message from Fisker to Fisker Ocean owners in a private VIN verified Facebook group. Thanks for the feedback. Our goal is to have everyone in group one or group two at all times. We're working hard to make that happen. It should appear straightforward if you're in group one, but if you're unsure about being in group two, three, or four, you're more than welcome to send us a PM. And here's those groups. Group 1, you are already on software version 1.10 and we are updating you to 1.11 as we speak. Once fully updated to 1.11, your car will show the correct release notes. Group 2, you're already on software 1.10, but we have not started updates for your car yet. Your software version may have been manually confirmed by an employee. If you're unsure, please PM us. Group 3, you're not quite up to date, but your Fisker Ocean is capable and you're on the way there. You're seeing a version lower than 1.10 in your user interface. You should be updated very soon. And Group 4, a small group of Fisker Ocean 1 owners are on older versions versions not compatible with the new software since the vehicle was delivered. This situation is not exclusive to a single market and impacts a group of owners worldwide. We are aware that some of you are having uncomfortable experiences and we're working through the steps to get your vehicle scheduled with our service centers. All the best from the Fisker team. It takes a lot for a startup, especially Fisker, to admit something is wrong. Uncomfortable experiences. And there's a very clear cut problem for a statistically significant number of owners when it comes to software. The silver lining here is that the direct message via Facebook may be the best way to contact Fisker if you have a problem. They seem to be very responsive and get back to you very quickly, probably because it affects their metrics on Facebook. Remember my family member who took a test drive? I was able to get him from getting into the Model Y to driving it in less than one minute, and it was his first experience with any electric car. I simply stated, it's a go-kart. One pedal does it all. And that was it. He understood. After about six feet of backing up, he understood the driving dynamics. If I wanted to make his experience less aggressive, I could have switched it to chill mode, and he would have known what that meant because of what it's called. Compare that to the ocean and its drive modes. Earth mode is more regen, less power, more pedal travel, and more range. Want to merge? Gotta floor it. Want to get some acceleration? You gotta floor it. It also drastically impacts the performance of your HVAC. Fun mode is middle regen, more power than Earth mode, but not all the power, and average pedal travel. And if you thought this was meticulously thought through, Fisker recommends you use fun mode for daily driving, but starts the vehicle out in Earth mode every time you turn it on. Hyper mode is all the power, or at least almost all the power, less regen, unless you go into settings and ask for more regen. But there's not enough regen in any of these modes to stop your car. And no matter what, it behaves like a gas car in the fact that when you don't apply any pressure to either pedal, it just rolls forward, unless you're on a hill, at which point it will roll backwards. Oh, and if you want all the power, you'll have to ask the car, and if it's okay with the car, it will allow you to use it, but you must be going 4 miles per hour or less. With boost on, it's more than a second faster to 60 than a long-range Model Y, but it's two-tenths slower than a Model Y performance, and you can only ask for it 500 times. The Model Y has no screen, no heads-up display on the driver cluster, nothing for the driver. You must look to the right or left, shout out to my right-hand drivers, in order to see any information. Conversely, the Ocean has the most information-dense, easy-to-understand driver's screen I've ever seen on a car. 
You've just got to find a seat and steering wheel combination that allows you to see it. And that's a little easier said than done as the adjustment of the steering column is more limited than you would expect and the seat does not adjust as much as you'd probably like, including a lack of lumbar. If you get a Fisker Ocean and you live in North America, chances are your fix-a-flat exploded on your oceans trip across the ocean. Like a fix-a-flat kind of thing? Yeah. That had leaked all over. You probably don't have floor mats, even if you ordered them, and nobody knows when you'll get them, but they'll be happy to open a ticket. Speaking of tickets, there is an 800 number that you can call, no matter what trim of the ocean you plan on getting. However, good luck getting someone to answer at a Tesla 800 number. Disclaimer, do not call this number. I have no idea where it goes, and I have not looked to see. Let's talk about service. Service is the profit machine for the dealership. That's why a new key for my 2012 RAV4 was a $400 quote from the dealer. But Tesla is not a dealership, so the experience is different. The dealership has an incentive to make your experience good. There's no incentive for Tesla to earn your future business. You bought your car online. And that process is so simple, you'll probably do it again if your experience with the car is good. That's why Tesla tries to turn away as much warranty work as possible, and other work too, for that matter. They told me to go somewhere else to get a windshield when my wife cracked hers on her Model 3. So you have to push a little bit to get things done. Once they are done, they're good for the most part. And if you're fortunate enough to get mobile service, that's really convenient and can be really good and simple. To compare, let's walk through a Fisker Ocean 1 experience right now from delivery up to a service completion. This is a series of emails a customer sent me after delivery and a week of ownership and a service appointment and covers almost everything I want to go through when it comes to service. The customer information was sent to me via email at adamsevreviews at yahoo.com. Feel free to reach out to me anytime with any questions or concerns. That said, here we go. The doors and trunk won't lock and unlock on command. I parked it overnight and found the tailgate open in the driveway in the rain. The windows and tailgate window also accept commands intermittently. California mode only works from inside the car. The key fob only works from about 10 feet away. No comprehensive list is provided by Fisker of the features that are present and those that aren't. I find new ones missing as I drive. The phone app doesn't do anything. Functions fail without warning all the time and require an infotainment reboot. Backup cameras are not infotainment. Alarm resulted after foggy weather. Constant alarms can't be silenced. No garage door opener. No built-in Alexa. Maximum 32 amp home charging. Around 6 kilowatts. Pre-delivery quality control is non-existent. Mine was delivered on a Sunday with one hour notice at 7 a.m. Including low tire pressure and minor paint scuffs. Total power failure two hours after delivery that corrected itself several hours later. Here's that example. State of charge went from 70 to zero and everything is locked and the car won't move. When it was time for an update, I thought you might like to know the Fisker Techs are liking your content. My Fisker Tech contact sent me this to prepare for an over-the-air update, and that does happen to be my actual video. I had a visit today with Fisker Software Tech at my home to investigate the various software issues. It took about 10 days to escalate my concerns. I had an extensive conversation. The tech does a Zoom meeting with the tech group several times per week. He also has meetings with corporate and Gita Fisker daily. He worked on most of the cars shipped to the Virginia DC site until a month ago when staffing increased and he was assigned to my region. After connecting my car to a laptop and OBD, he could read my software version and history and was convinced that I have had an unannounced over-the-air software update sometime after I received the car. He says the next update will resolve many of the bugs I and others are having. He has seen it and says the improvement is in touch response and errors is noticeable. Not to be confused with the update coming in Q1 of 2024. Some owners' OTA updates were rolled back because they found it caused new problems. Numbers ending in 2.7 are the latest US version. You can only definitively tell your software version by connecting to the car. He's seen positive improvements in the company's response to issues and feel they are on the correct path. He drives a Model Y and likes the Ocean One's style, ride, comfort, and steering wheel. This customer also had an Ultra on the way, and right now he's holding off to see how these problems are fixed with updates. We call this the early adopter penalty, and it may not be the experience for every Fisker Ocean owner. Many have had really good experiences, but it's just part of owning a first vehicle from a company. I made a whole video about it. You can check it out in the description. So what else is there to learn about the Model Y and the Fisker Ocean? I learn new stuff every day and I have a sport trim on the way to the States right now. Hit that subscribe and I'll do everything I can to keep you up to date on everything going on with Fisker. So which one to buy? Instead of recommending one or the other for you, I'm just gonna give you advantages and disadvantages for both. In order to get this review right, I have to dispel some industry assumptions about the people who buy electric vehicles and why they buy them. And for that, we have to 
zoom out. Let's group up the buyers. First, you have early adopters or person A, let's call them. These are people who are actively researching and trying to get into the EV market because it's new. It's also interesting and fun. We as car owners happen to like all those things. The aughts was a horrible decade for creativity in automobiles. The new M3 or the new CL55 or the new RX350. But right at the end came the Roadster and then the Nissan Leaf, followed by the Model S, etc. And those vehicles gave birth to the compliance era of electric vehicles. You know the stars, but the compliance era has been over since the Model 3. We are in the opulence era, the tail end of the opulence era to be exact, and the EV era is next, or the era of the EV. You know they call me the Lord of War. It's not Lord of War. It's Warlord. Thank you, but I prefer it my way. And if you notice, the auto industry severed the head of the compliance era as soon as profit could be made on an electric vehicle, or at least investment could be justified. Because we couldn't have a coexisting compliance and opulence era for obvious reasons. So why is EV demand at a standstill right now? Because the opulence era cars are old. What was once coveted is now regular, you know, like your Lyft driver might have one. But they still cost too much. And right now it's not even the sticker price. We haven't survived the pandemic era quite yet. The impact is still here in the form of interest rates. They make this car cost the same as this car. And this car this isn't cool anymore. And person A, the only person who could afford the car when it was cool, already has one. Your person A might trade around, but for the most part, the early adopters have adopted. When selecting a vehicle, person A has two tiers of importance. The make or break tier and the heavy consideration tier. Tier 1, or the make or break tier for person A, is style, design, driving feel, long range, curb appeal, ease of use, scarcity, and wow factor. Tier 2 is small for person A, price and practicality. They aren't deal breakers, but they're still in consideration. If we were talking about gas cars, tier three would be brand loyalty, but we all know that that doesn't really play here. If you're a Honda guy like I used to be, well... You just have to say that you're fine when you're not. Yeah. Then you've got person B. Let's call them the Tesla stretch. They're really reaching to pay opulence era prices for cars they can barely afford. In 2021, person A bought an Ionic 5 at 60,000 MSRP, but got promo financing and paid the fees up front. Person B can't afford to do that, has to stretch to 84 months, and they had to get a $50,000 Ionic 5, but their total cost is the same amount, and they're still making a $700 a month car payment. But because of that, they've done research and they figured out that EVs are cheaper to own in the long term, and the budgeting for them is easier because you can't budget for gas. You just can't. So what are person B's preferences? Person B is just person A reversed. Tier one is price and practicality and all the fun stuff is in tier two. The Tesla stretcher wants all those cool things, but they're not willing to sacrifice the purchase just to get them. Hence why price and practicality are so important for them. So what's the biggest difference between person A and person B? Well, person A already has an EV. Person B is looking to get their first one right now. Also, person A has less risk, less leverage, and more options to deal with the problem if it were to occur. Which is why it's been okay for Fisker to deliver cars that aren't quite finished to early adopters. But if person B gets into an ocean and it's not what they expected as far as reliability and service, or maybe there's a bankruptcy, that could be a big problem. And in my humble opinion, Fisker is not ready to service this customer yet. So contrary to popular belief, a lot of the people who are shopping for an EV right now are not trying to buy them because they're cool. And I suspect it'll be a hit among people looking to make the switch to EV, but they want something practical and kind of cool. Side note, I'm almost 100% sure that man has never even charged an EV before, so why are we listening to him? People and by people, I mean people right now, are buying EVs to save money on gasoline or to stop buying gasoline. And EVs are starting to make sense for basically everyone. I used to argue back and forth with people about why a gas car was better than an EV. It's kind of been distilled down to just... Wham, wham. Wham, 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 and that's it. And that's it. But there's a huge disconnect between EVs and buyers, and a huge part of the market is missing. And when those people start buying EVs, we will have entered the EV era. So who is person C? The used market. And it's too broad to describe as far as the type of buyer. Because if we don't buy new, we buy used. And this is how many people buy used. And that's all. Kevin! I mean, that's it. When that Inflation Reduction Act rule about used vehicles goes into play, you know, 
this one, then we know we're in the EV era. We can call it the iPhone era if you want. I had no cell phone until digital service came to my area. Then I could afford one. And once I had budgeted for owning a phone, better phones came along. Data plans were extremely expensive, hard to justify, and completely useless for most people. Until the iPhone 3GS. It had features that made owning a phone make sense, like the App Store. A five-year contract plus about $20 extra monthly put about 90% of the functionality of that HP pavilion on your desk with massive monitor into your hand. The smartphone was here to stay. So if EVs go the way of the cell phone, person B who is shopping for an EV right now is also a really early adopter, unless you live in Norway. Why am I talking cell phones? Because it's easy to hate the YouTuber who has a Lucid, but it's harder to hate your dad for owning an EV. So what does this have to do with the Model Y and Fisker Ocean? Person A is buying the Fisker Ocean 1. It's the newest thing, but the Extreme Ultra and Sport, the Ultra and Sport especially, have a completely different market and they're all Person B. And they need price and practicality. And part of practicality is reliability. And the Ocean ticks all those other cool boxes. But that $25,000 used EV threshold is fast approaching and it will turn Person B to Person C overnight, which means Fisker is running out of time in more ways than one. So let's do it. Advantages and disadvantages of the Fisker Ocean and the Model Y. One. Has to be price. Fisker is a startup and a lot has changed in the four years since they figured out how they'd have to price the ocean. Tesla is definitely not a startup anymore and they currently offer the best bargain in the business in every vehicle class that they compete. And that's the way you do it. Advantage one for Fisker, it's new. New design, new company, new design language, Everything about it is brand spanking new, and you get to be a part of that. In fact, Henrik Fisker's goal is to have four brand new features on every one of his vehicles that are offered by no other company. Part of being a new company and a new vehicle is having a new approach to building vehicles, and Fisker has done that as well with a dedication to sustainability. It's also why you pay the premium. Advantage two for Tesla is software. Anyone can pretend that Fisker is going to have revolutionary software features in the future. It's just that currently they don't. Advantage Tesla. Advantage number two for Fisker is design. It looks cooler. No question, no notes. Design, perfect. No bad angles on the Fisker Ocean. Henrik Fisker has a history in design and it's decorated. He's one of the best. If this car didn't have a beautiful silhouette, there's no way I would have a YouTube channel about it. The reason I reserved it so early, so long ago, was because it was the best looking SUV I'd ever seen with a plug, point blank. Advantage number three for Tesla is call it what you want, tried and true, road tested. My favorite expression, it's not a driveway ornament. People drive these things. Hertz has 80,000 of them. It is the ultimate electric road trip or arguably the ultimate road trip car in North America. We could call it a myriad of things, but let's call it verified reliability. Ocean One owners notify me and celebrate when they have several drives in a row without any error messages or problems. I did 11,000 miles on my Model Y this year with no error messages or issues. If 3,000 people are willing to watch a video to find out if a Fisker Ocean can drive 142 miles in the rain, there might be a reliability issue. Verified and reliability are two words you do not use to describe the Fisker Ocean in 2024. Remember Remember, earlier in the video, Fisker admitted some ocean owners are having uncomfortable experiences. Uncomfortable experiences. So please refrain from accusing me of not having any evidence. So if the ocean isn't verified and can't guarantee reliability, what can it guarantee? Well, the third advantage is it is not a Model Y. Yes, I used it in the last comparison, but it is still true and likely means even more now than it did last year because in the last year, Tesla has sold a lot of Model Ys and they don't call Tesla's the California Camrys for nothing. They're reliable, there's a million of them, and because of that all the cool things about them kind of fade into mediocrity over time. In fact, the software allows Tesla to have a simple, ergonomic, minimalist design in the interior, throw that simple interior into the mix, and it looks like three reasons to buy a Camry 10 years ago. That said, part of owning a Model Y is also disadvantage number one. Go yourself. <laughs> What do we call this one? Controversial leadership behavior? How do I explain this to mom? How about that? Volatile public perception. There. Is that clear? I hope it is. Let's just go ahead and get all the Tesla disadvantages out of the way. It's an old design. Project Juniper is definitely on the way. And just like the Fisker is brand new, the current Model Y is at the very end of its life cycle. You can call hardware for the mid-cycle refresh, but either way, this design is on the way out. So what do you get when you add up verified reliability, reasonable price, and old design? Go to the next, uh, go to the next. 
That's a lot of dough for not a lot of cool. Does it mean its owners don't like it? Probably the opposite. Having a not cool car makes it easier to own, more inconspicuous, a stronger aftermarket, and a more knowledgeable community. And the kids still love it. But if you're going for sheer units of cool per dollar, a Fisker Ocean Sport will get you way more cool points per dollar than any Model Y. I'm just going to drop all three Fisker Ocean disadvantages at the same time, and then we can highlight the detail within each disadvantage. Execution, customer experience, and the early adopter penalty. Now we can get into detail. If the Ocean rollout was properly executed, it would have been an overnight sensation. 360 miles of range and a new design in an SUV should create unprecedented demand, premium secondary market value, and buckets and buckets of FOMO. Instead, Fisker botched the launch by launching too early, without enough staff, and without enough support, and now they can't buy an accounting officer. They have an incomplete car that rolls backwards, won't fast charge at EV Go, needs $6,900 worth of add-ons to provide a normal car level of features. A lot of the features in those packages don't work for anyone, including current owners. And despite being advertised initially as a $30,000 after the tax credit people's EV, the Fisker Ocean is a $50 plus thousand dollar broken software promise you from sure a company whose that? stock you can get for less than a coffee at McDonald's. How did my wife put it? Tesla has the best engineers in the world who can fix anything. What does Fisker have? Full disclosure, Tesla had some of these problems in the past, but they were also the only EV you could buy. So what's my recommendation? People who should buy a Fisker Ocean. If you want the absolute newest vehicle, if you want something rare and interesting if you want to win cars and coffee the ocean does those things in my opinion both cars are fun to drive but the ocean admittedly is fun to park because no matter what speed it's going or where it is the ocean gets attention if you're here doing research to find the best one before you make a purchase in the near future that's the model y it's better at road trips even though the ocean is the suv range king but we all know charging is more important on road trips than range both have one-of-a-kind features but an ocean owner has to be special too the car needs tlc because of the early adopter penalty penalty which I've distilled down to this list. This will be hard to do, this will affect your emotional driving experience, and in turn force this to be true. There is evidence of this everywhere and you'll have to take this into consideration also. Selling it's going to be hard, you're buying something that isn't done yet, and this one speaks for itself. But if Fisker can get it right in 2024, this is the best Model Y competition. The only question for you is, are you willing to risk it? Want to know what it's like to drive the ocean? That's here with a shorter version right here. Also, dive into the interface on this one thanks to Brian, Bill, and all the subscribers out there who have sent me photos and videos and information about the ocean. I couldn't make these videos without you. Subscribe for more. We'll see you on the next one. Hey, smash the like button. Thank you.